handle the slot because this Bengals team has so many versatile weapons at the wide receiver position. If they can get molded in there, that's a big deal for this Titans team. And it Welcome into the Hot Read Podcast for Black Friday, November the 25th. I'm your host, Easton Freeze, Director of Published Content at BroadwaySportsMedia.com. We are also brought to you by the 440 Podcast Network. Happy Black Friday, everybody. Hope you had a fantastic Thanksgiving and uh, ate a lot of fantastic food. I am joined, as always, by producer JT. JT, how are you? How was your Thanksgiving? I'm good. Happy Black Friday. Hope you're all getting your your favorite deals out the there deals. On, the, on the Black Fridays and whatnot and such but i had a good thanksgiving a lot of uh just sitting on the couch with some good foot good food and some good football yeah exactly it was it was a great day of football and food and that's what thanksgiving is all about uh we jt we post this show at like five in the morning or we schedule it to post at like 5 a.m because we record the night before most of the time and i think this might be the first time we have like a, a decent audience well before the sun comes up because we've got folks that may be listening to this podcast in the car on their way to uh, to go and get in line for Black Friday deals. If that's you, hit us up via social media. Tweet at us or DM us or whatever. I'd be curious to see if anybody was on their way to get deals and tell us what you got. Tell us what you got, and that's fascinating. We might just shout you out on the show. But I uh, hope everybody's getting their deals on Black Friday and uh, had a great day watching football yesterday. We are going to wait to do a recap of our best bet special. Um, we did, of course, the the Thanksgiving special edition betting episode of the hot read podcast on Wednesday. Um, And that was for all of the Thanksgiving games. We're in the middle as we're recording this of the last game of the day. So we've got some more of our props that we don't know how they resulted yet. And I want to be able to give a comprehensive look at how we did. So we'll probably review that as well as our picks from today's best bet gauntlet, all of that in the betting review on the Monday episode, when we're talking about the, uh, the review of the Titans Bengals game as well, of course, So today we'll stick to the basics because we know that this is still a holiday weekend for y'all. It's probably going to be a lesser audience of folks listening to this show. Still going to be a great show. uh, We've got some great stuff lined up for you. Of course, the Best Bet Gauntlet, which we are uh, continuing to make money on. And so uh, we're going to have those picks coming up at the end of the show as always. We will also have a special interview, first ever solo interview From producer JT, he got to speak to an old buddy of his who I'll let him intro when we get closer to that in a moment. But they had a great talk. He's a a Cincy native, JT is, and he spoke to somebody that works in and around Cincinnati sports radio. So uh, our interview this week is somebody that knows plenty about this Bengals team coming into town. So a lot of uh, great context kind of from behind enemy lines. If you're a Titans fan who listens to the show. We will uh, we'll open the show with our Titans news, which we have quite a bit to get to this week. JT, I was telling you earlier in the week that it's very refreshing. After the extended rest the Titans got, the quiet weekend for them, after their Thursday night football game last week, they you know have the weekend off, everybody's resting, there's other NFL news and games going on, and they just kind of go dark for a while. And in terms of content to talk about on our last couple of shows, we've kind of been having to get creative. Not this week. We've got plenty to talk about in the news from this week. So without further ado, JT, let's run down this week's Titans news. Alrighty, getting into some Titans news today on this Thanksgiving evening when we are recording this. This will be Friday morning for you. Let's talk about the health of the Titans. It's a little bit tricky considering the Titans did not practice on Thursday of Thanksgiving. So a lot of it was estimated, but let's talk about a couple big names here. Randy Bullock, Kristen Fulton, Ben Jones, and Jeffrey Simmons were all projected as limited participants, but Fulton and Bullock are a little more iffy considering they haven't practiced at all, um, including on Wednesday. Another name in this mix here is Ben Jones. He's pretty interesting as Mike Vrabel spoke on Wednesday saying the final parts of Ben Jones clearing concussion protocol still hasn't happened yet. So he's still in that protocol and Danico Autry has not practiced yet at all this week, but expressed over Twitter that he is feeling good 
probably won't go this week, but who do you see on this injury report that you are hopeful will go this week, Easton? So briefly on Danico Autry, he won't be going this week. I'd be very surprised if he is. The good news is, based on what we've heard, kind of the vibes from him and the team, sounds like they've avoided massive, uh, you know, issues with his knee injury and that it's it's going to be a situation where he does play again this year, maybe even soon, which is great news for the Titans. Obviously, he's a Pro Bowl candidate and has been fantastic. The kicker situation is an interesting one. The Titans brought back from PUP, Caleb Shudak, who they put on uh, the physically unable to perform list in the preseason. Uh, it may have even been earlier than the preseason games. I think it may have been all the way back at the beginning of training camp. He went on the physically unable to perform list, the PUP list, and was kind of uh, lost in the ether and afterthought in terms of a guy that might come back this year. Well, he's back. He is back and healthy. And he even said in interviews that he was kind of worried that his football career might have been over after that injury in training camp, which is scary. But he sounds like he's back and healthy and ready to kick in relief this week if Randy Bullock can't go. According to special teams coaches, it sounds like Bullock is going to be probably held out of this game, but still very much up in the air. They're wanting to avoid him pushing to go in this game and further injuring himself and, and removing his himself as available for the rest of the season. And that would be a, a significant issue. With Shudak, he provides much more power. He's a younger guy, bigger leg. So on kickoffs and on field goals, he provides what, frankly, Randy Bullock has been lacking for a while in that power. He's very, re very reliable inside of 45 yards, but beyond that is kind of scary with Randy Bullock. We've established the Randy zone between 45 and 50 yards is a very dangerous place to be with Randy Bullock. If Caleb Shudak, which he was brought in uh, by the Titans in the first place to be a competitor with Bullock and potentially usurp him from that job if he starts to work out bullock's relative ease at the position for the past two years his kind of confidence and comfort that he's enjoyed as the kicker for the team may become a serious question very quickly and he may be fighting for his job which is just the way that it goes um the other guys on that list I, with ben jones i was kind of I mean, we were all surprised that he was on the injury report at all with a concussion after he was spoken to by me and other members of the media following that Denver game uh, two Sundays ago in which he seemed totally fine. He played the full game. He didn't seem banged up really at all in the post game or in the locker room. When I spoke to him, we played an interview clip that I had from my discussion with him on the show that Monday. And then he gets put on the concussion list and he doesn't play on Thursday night in Green Bay. The good news in terms of whether he plays or not is the Titans have serviceable guys to, to fill in. So that's not a big concern. If he can't go, obviously not great. And it is it weakens the state of this offensive line. But it's not a dramatic, you know, it's not a disaster. They looked fine on Thursday night against Green Bay. He, if he can go, it's, it's very good news for the team. And the vibes that I'm getting, again, we don't know. They've not practiced a ton this week. It's projected this most recent injury report. I kind of think he's going to play just based on how it didn't seem like a big deal to begin with. And he's, you know, projected to be a limited participant. I feel like he's going to get out of the pro protocol, but maybe not. If he's not this week, he almost certainly will be the following week with Christian Fulton, that hamstring. I, I no idea to be entirely honest with you. I, I'm not going to just make stuff up. Uh, I, I don't know, man. He may he may go and, and he may not. He's had this nagging hamstring all year, and I'm trying to think of anything else to say besides I don't know. I, I'm not gonna flounder and and lie to our our audience. I don't think uh, you can really know. He may be a game decision. It, it's just a hamstring pull. It's one of those day to day things. We'll see. The other guys on that list, Jeffrey Simmons, I think he's going to go. 10 days of rest. He's a he's a guy that loves to not practice just to get that rest and and play. And then uh, who else was on the Bud Dupree? He was full both days this way, right, JT? Yeah, he was. And just a little bit of a note on Bud Dupree. Uh, you tweeted about it earlier this week. In his hip injury that he is still listed with is not the same hip that he was dealing with earlier in the season. So that is a little bit of interesting to note there. It is. So we thought that it was the same hip nagging him all year long. Turns out it's not. He had fle uh, hip flexor issues with both hips now. The first two times, the first time he injured it, and then when he tweaked it earlier in the year, that was one side. I don't know which. And then this most recent injury on Thursday night, I believe. It was uh, no. Yes. Oh, okay, the, was it on? Was I it on Thursday? So. It was either in the Denver game or in, on Thursday night. He tweaked the other hip flexor, 
And uh, But he seems like he's good to go. He was a full participant in both practices this week. So I think he's going to be back. That's big for the defense. Also probably coming back is Hooker. Uh, the safety position is going to be much more reinforced. They're going to be able to afford to do more of those three-man safety looks, which is huge between Hooker and Bayard and Andrew Adams. And then the corner position. We've been banging the drum relentlessly all year. When they have all of their corners healthy and back in, specifically Elijah Molden available in the slot, it makes what they can do with their cornerbacks so much more diverse. And really, whether or not they have Fulton out there is less important to me, frankly, against this team than it is they have a guy like Molden in there who can handle the slot because this Bengals team has so many versatile weapons at the wide receiver position. If they can get Molden in there, affording McCreary the opportunity to go on the outside and guard some of these perimeter receivers that the Bengals have, that's a big deal for this Titans team. And it, it keeps some of those lesser cornerbacks on the roster from having to go up against some of these elite receivers that the Bengals have on the outside. So that's really good news. And I think the, the trio that I'm very confident will be back of Dupree, Hooker, and Molden is a massive, massive deal for this defense, regardless of who else comes back. Yeah, speaking of the those Bengals weapons, on the Bengals side of the injury report, running back Joe Mixon continues to trend towards looking like he's not going to play this week. He's still in concussion protocol and has logged two DMPs so far. Uh, when you're listening to this, the injury report that comes out today will uh, really tell the, t the story here, but I'm looking at him to probably not go this week. However, Jamar Chase continues to look like he will play this weekend, logging two limited practices and Joe Burrow in a presser on Wednesday said that the team and himself expects him to play. So getting those guys back on the Titans secondary is going to be huge this week as he also looks to get back. A few others for the Bengals here, uh, just a couple other names. Lyle Collins, the tackle, and Trey Hendrickson returned to practice for the Bengals today. So that's huge for both sides of the line. I want to key in on um, Jamar Chase real quick, JT, and call me a cynic, but I believe if they say he's going to play or they think he's going to play, then I believe them. However, this was a guy that was on crutches less than a week ago. I have a hard time believing he's going to be as effective as he can be in this game if he goes. I just, I refuse to believe that he is 100%. And at this point in the year, nobody in the NFL is 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't think that he, with this injury, is going to be at full strength. And I'm not sure that a hobbled Jamar Chase is the worst thing in the world for the Titans. I know that's kind of playing with fire, and this could totally come back to bite them. Hopefully, they're taking him seriously. But from an analyst perspective, I ha I just, I I'll listen to any thoughts you have from a, a Bengals standpoint. I have a hard time believing that he will be a massive impact in this game, whether he goes or not. What are your thoughts? I think if you look at it, just reading between the lines of what I've seen from the Bengals side of this, Jamar Chase is a competitor. I don't think he knows how important he is to this team, and he's not going to come back if he can, if he can't like at least make an impact. So I think he feels at least like he's healthy enough. And once again, he might have been on crutches a week ago, but if the injury was truly like as serious as it was for his hip there, I feel like the Bengals would have put him on, on IR if it truly was something that was going to affect how he plays the position. I think in any kind of facet that he comes back, he's going to be someone who you have to, you have to call, bring attention to because he's just Jamar Chase. Um, sure. So any, if anything, it's less of how much will Jamar Chase impact it, but how much do the Titans focus on him leaving guys like Tyler Boyd and T. Higgins to kind of feast. And having him as a chess piece for the Bengals is, is an advantage. Like you say, whether or not he's the guy that can, you know, go for 15 catches and 200 yards in a game or not, which I tend to lean he probably won't be in this game, him being out there demands a certain amount of attention, and that can be valuable if the Bengals manage to use that in a way that allows other guys to get open. So that'll be something to watch. Um, I think that that could be a massive tipping point on the scale of this game just how much he can impact the game and how much he's on the field again this is one of those things that maybe he does play but maybe he you know is on half the snap count that he typically is we'll have to see it's it's a big question mark in this game it's something that I'm fascinated to look at when we get to the game on Sunday yeah let's talk about a few more things before we get out of this new segment here let's talk about Mike Vrabel's numbers coming off extended rest 
whether that be the bye or Thursday night football. Of course, we've talked about this before, but I'm just going to run them down because they have just been truly impressive. Mike Vrabel with extended rest, so following the bye, or like this last week where they played on Thursday night football, had Sunday off and kind of got an extra week here. He is a perfect 9-0 record with the Titans, having an average of 28.4 points per game and only allowing 10.7 points per game. The average margin of victory is 17.7 points. So it's a big streak on the line on Sunday for these Titans, especially against a absolutely just electric and point putting up offense like the Bengals. That's right. It's This is a big streak on the line for him. And I'm not sure. I'd have to go back and look. But in those nine games, I really doubt they played any teams well that's a lie there's only one team in, in those nine games that i can think of that was really good and that was the bills a couple years ago during that covid year but I, they've not played a team as good as this bengals team coming off of rest so that streak is on the bye but mike vrabel in my opinion is the best coach in the entire league right now so him getting any extra time to prepare as an opposing team would scare me to death and that's all we got today All right, that is JT with the news. Now, JT, I will let you do the honors of prefacing this interview that you spoke to an old pal and a sports media professional in Cincinnati. Tell us about this interview and and let's get into it. Yeah, so on Wednesday, which is yesterday, two days now for you guys, I sat down with an old buddy and a special guest who is a first timer here on the show. His name is Elliot Rearing. Elliot is a Cincinnati native who works with iHeartMedia on radio stations like 700 WLW and ESPN 1530 up in Cincinnati, of course, with a bunch of their hosts up there and is very knowledgeable about the Cincinnati Bengals and has a lot to say about this game going into kind of what, like you said on Twitter, what everybody considers a revenge game here for the Titans besides Mike Vrabel and Ryan Tannehill. So let's jump right into that. Alrighty, so we're going to get into this uh, interview here with a special guest, and I know, of course, it's a little bit different here on this show. Of course, Easton Freeze, your host, is not here, so producer JT is going to step in here and do this interview all by himself here, a little bit (laughs) different on this show, but I am here with a special guest and first-timer on the show, Elliot Rearing. Elliot, of course, is a Cincinnati native who is with iHeartMedia on 700 WLW and ESPN 1530 radio up in Cincinnati. Elliot, how are you today? I am great. I am. I've never been more excited for a podcast in my entire life. Yeah, this I know. Be it's the a, biggest moment in my life. It's no a big pressure, moment, no big pressure to right you here. Exactly right. Um, huge game coming up this weekend, of course. Uh, in the Titans media, we're hearing a lot about how to a lot of players and fans, it is sort of a rivalry revenge game here for the Titans. Here, everybody except head coach Mike Vrabel and Ryan Tannehill are treating it as such. They're yep. a little bit more professional. But I want to jump right in here. To getting to talk about this game, and of course, we are recording this on Wednesday. Um, and on this day, Joe Burrow came out today in a presser and talked about how the team expects Jamar Chase to be looking to go this weekend for the Bengals. If he does indeed go, that will be a huge addition back for this Bengals team. How big of an impact do you think he will have for this Bengals team against the Titans? He is everything. He is, he is I mean, what we have when we have Jamar Chase is a Super Bowl contending roster. You saw it when we played the Browns. We didn't have him, and everything kind of went haywire. Burrow kind of lost himself a little bit. Uh, We got it back, obviously, the game after. But with Jamar Chase, we have another part of that offense that just – it's just impossible to stop. You know, we we rank third in points scored per game. I think we're at 26.5 points scored per game. Most of that's because of Jamar Chase. Jamar Chase is everything. Uh, Now, granted, we have T. Higgins. We have Tyler Boyd, but what Jamar Chase allows is for T. Higgins to then get open because Jamar draws the double coverage, obviously. So now we have Boyd and Higgins more open than they would be alone. Definitely, and this Titans secondary is kind of shoddy. We've had a lot of injuries on that front there, so definitely having Jamar Chase back will pose a little bit more of a threat to this Titans secondary. Of course, another player on the offense is Joe Mixon, who is still in concussion protocol. And as of Wednesday, we still really don't have a good idea of if he will go or not. And of course, the Titans team, as we've talked about on this show, has a top five defensive unit, especially against the run in this league. Elliot, what do you think are going to be some keys to the Bengals finding success against them if they do not have Mixon this week? 
the biggest part of the what, what I think are key to the game is is time of possession. Right now, we rank sixth in the NFL in time of possession. Uh, if we can get the ball out of Derrick Henry's hands, not allow you guys as Titans fans to as as Titans uh, media, we can't let the Titans get the ball for the entire game. You have to stop the run, and we have to hold the ball. We have to be confident. Samaj P. Ryan, if Mixon isn't able to go, will actually help the Bengals in the passing game. Uh, Samaj has been phenomenal at pass blocking. Mixon's been horrible. Mixon's the, maybe the worst pass blocking running back in the league. Uh, obviously, I know what he does on the offensive side of the ball when it terms to running and pass catching. But obviously, as you know, <laughs> you're from Cincinnati. Uh, our offensive line has been a major issue. It's been an issue for last year, the year before that. Uh, for the last decade, our offensive line has been a problem. So with Samaj P. Ryan, uh, I think it'll allow Joe Burrow to have a couple more seconds, second and a half more to get the ball out of his hands. We control the clock, uh, get up early. The Bengals have been using the mentality to, to uh, elect to have the ball first. I know that's been kind of like an NFL don't do type of thing. Um, teams elect to kick off so they can get the second half. That's not been our motto. We take the ball first, we go. And I think that's what we need to do. Get ahead early, minimize the Derrick Henry effect, and see what Tannehill can do in the air. Because if, 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 if we allow Derrick Henry, um, or excuse me, Ryan Tannehill, if we allow Ryan Tannehill to get the ball in the air, I do think we win this game. Yeah, and of course, like you said, that's an interesting point because the Titans all year have been kind of a team who has started out hot. They are one of the best in the league against uh, teams when they get up early, and they do a lot. I think actually right now that you bring that up, that's a really good point. I think, especially in the red zone, I think the Bengals – are the number one team in red zone to touchdown conversions with like a 75%. And I think the Titans are second with like a 74.3. Yeah. I'm not exactly the number, but they're both really, really good in the red zone there. So it'll be important to see which team kind of gets out to a big start and kind of maybe could turn into a little bit of a boat race in this game, which is something that we didn't see last year. No. Of course, something that we saw last year, like you were saying, Samaj P. Ryan, I think is going to play a big game in a big game position in this game if Mixon does not go because we saw last year how important Mixon was to this team like you said this offensive line is just it's it's not the best it it, it was no. supposed to be an upgrade <laughs> and really it's been kind of a shock to all Cincinnati fans of how just kind of discombobulated and all over the place this offensive line has been and it, it's it just seems like Joe Burrow is going to have to get the ball out quick he's going to have to get it out fast and that's where Samanji P. Ryan has really excelled you can go back and look at the Steelers game last week where Samanji Pirine was kind of their offense and how they got this game kind of signed, sealed and delivered last week. So that will be a huge help to them. Like you were saying, we're going to go back to a point real quick here um, as you were talking about how they're going to have to stop Derrick Henry and Ryan Tannehill, the defense for the Bengals also continues to get healthier and healthier. And how do you think, especially will they look to stop uh, Tannehill through the air? Our, our secondary has been a bit of an issue uh, because after a woozy went down, we still don't have a woozy uh, and he was kind of like the soul of our defense. Um, I do think if Tannehill is forced to throw, I think you guys ranked, I believe I checked this out before this interview, I think 30th and pass offense passing yards per game. Um, if I do believe if Tannehill is forced to throw and no disrespect to the, uh, the great Titans fandom, but you guys don't have a receiver. I think I've never seen a, a, wor a worse I mean, yeah. group of receivers. I, think I mean, who is he throwing to? He's Robert got, Woods? He's got Ray, Robert Woods, who has not been good. Um, there's a little guy who they picked up in the draft called Traylon Burks, who had his kind of coming out game last week against the Green yep. Bay Packers, went for, I think, around eight catches for 119 yards, almost scored at the end of that game. And I think that's going to be one of the guys that you need to look out for this week. Definitely someone who is starting to kind of grow and mature as a first-year receiver in this league. I also wouldn't be surprised if you saw uh, two guys' names in the tight end position here. Austin Hooper has been being worked more and more into this offense. And then I'm going to give you a run for your money on this name right here. Uh -oh. Jake Okonkwo, the new nope. rookie tight end here. Nope. He's going to be someone who they are trying to get him the ball here and kind of is a little bit Jonu Smith-esque as if you listen to the show. Um in the past couple of weeks, we've been calling his name a lot. And I think we're due for a big breakout game, but they do have some sneaky receivers and they're starting to kind of get their receiving core back together. The issue I would have um, right now, if I were a Titans fan is if you have 
Derrick Henry stalled. If let's say if, if the Bengals managed to stop him to 70 yards, and I know in the playoff game he was coming off an injury, so we kind of got to help there. Um, but Ryan Tannehill is a game manager in the truest sense of the word. I don't know if he's had any game winning touchdown passing drives, as, as far as I'm concerned. I don't, I mean, I could be wrong on that. I don't know how many he's had, but especially in that division that you guys play in, which again, all due respect, might be the worst division I've ever seen. <laughs> it is, uh, uh, I, I don't know how, how many times you've had to do that. So in a shootout, I do like the Bengals chances to, uh, maintain the dominance part of that. I, I, I just don't think the Titans have enough in Tannehill in the receiving in the receivers, excuse me, to keep up with us. The, I, I, Truly, I think the key to the game is if you guys get the ball, you run it with Derrick Henry, you control the clock, and at that point, you minimize everything we do. Because I don't think our defense is in a great spot right now. I think we're right in the middle. I think we're at 15, uh, 15th in, in, in defensive stats. So if you average them all out, uh, that's in my opinion, that's the key to the game for you guys. If that if that happens, that's what's going to win this game. But I was I was intrigued. I don't know if you I know we're going to get to it eventually. The spread is interesting to me. The one and a half point is weird. It's it really weird... is. It, it started out as a pick as well, I think, at the opening lines this week. Definitely, it's been kind of floating around that uh, one to one and a half range, which is it, it just like these Thanksgiving games tomorrow, as I'm sure you know, it is a tough week to kind of find where do you find the value on these lines here. Yeah, It's it going to be a really interesting one. I'd be interested to hear what you think of this line this week. I think I do think the Bengals will win. Obviously, I'm a homer. I'm going to think the Bengals are going to win. But I do think the Bengals offense right now is in a groove. You know, we've scored a lot of points our past couple of games. I do think we've found something. Um, the Titans defense is phenomenal. There's no question about that. The Titans defense is very, very good. And our offensive line is very, very bad. So if there is a chance, I think I think you guys sacked Burrow eight times in that playoff game, seven or eight times. Yeah, I think it was like eight or nine, actually. It was eight like or almost, nine. It was almost record setting. Yeah. Uh, if that is the case, then again, we're in trouble. But I do think if the Bengals score first, get up to maybe a 10 nothing lead. If we're up 10 nothing, I like our chances of holding that lead, keeping the clock, eliminating Derrick Henry completely. And if that happens, I do think it's over. I, I would take the Bengals if I had to, which I will be betting, actually. I will be taking Bengals minus one and a half because I do think we're just a better team offensively, not defensively, offensively. And in, in the league right now is an offensive league, as you see with Mahomes. So in, that, in, in my opinion, that's, and that's, that's what I would take. Yeah, and it's really interesting. Um, it's going to be a big spot for these Titans teams. Like you were saying, the Bengals put up a lot of points here in their past couple of games. And on the other side of the ball here, the Titans, they've come out fast out of the gate. But in that second half, they have struggled to find points. So it's going to be a real test here for the Titans to show what they're made of. Of course, that has kind of been – the narrative has been reversed. They, under T Todd Downing, um, have – kind of found their groove in the second half and mm -hmm. have found a little bit more success. But I think this is going to be uh, a bigger test for them like the Chiefs game was. Let's move on. And as we know, you are a big time better on a couple of your shows in Cincinnati. Of course, yeah, yeah. if you are a listener of the Hot Read podcast, you know that we are here. So what are your favorite plays for the upcoming weekend? All right. Now, you guys know I'm not a good gambler. When you guys did your research on me, you had someone had to know that I'm not good at this. Now it doesn't stop me from betting. Obviously, I sometimes I go on a hot streak. You never know. What's your guy? Are you guys good at gambling? What do we got? Do you guys? So do you guys we do. Work? We do a thing here on the show called the Best Bet Gauntlet. Basically, oh, okay. me and our host Easton Freeze pick our five. We draft basically back and forth, back and forth. We drive. We draft our five, both our five best lines on the show, and then we go head to head every week. I think currently in the standings. So basically, it's a, a season long thing here, and we tally them up at the end of the year. And whoever wins is the sports shark champion for this show. There we and go. And they are crowned. I think currently our host, Easton Freeze, sits at like, I think, 31, 26, and 2, something around there. Pretty good. Pretty good. Um, and then I, uh, maybe just like you, I have my hot streaks and cold streaks. I am <laughs> currently a perfect 500 at 25, 25, and 2. There we go. Hey, five. No, not bad. I'm, 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 I'm making you money some weeks. I'm, I'm losing <laughs> you, but I, I come out even, right? That's right. Even money is uh, positive money to me. All right, so I'm gonna go Chiefs. My biggest bet of this of this weekend: Chiefs minus fourteen and a half. People aren't gonna want to bet it because of the fourteen and a half. People like that. That as as I, I I know they're called football numbers, right? Thirteen and a half, six and a half. If you have the two touchdowns, people don't like to go over that by a half point. 
because of the hook. I would take Chiefs minus 14 and a half. I think the Rams are the worst team in football. Uh, I think they're dead last in almost every offensive category. Um, and I believe Stafford's out. So now they have yeah. nothing. It actually came out today that the, the Rams are going to be trotting out there. Uh, young, I think he's a rookie, Bryce Perkins as their quarterback this <laughs> week. So without Cooper Cup, having Bryce uh what why I just forgot his name. What did I just even say? Perkins, Bryce, Bryce Perkins. Perkins. That's his name. It's it's just <laughs> kind of out there. They also waived Daryl Henderson, so they're kind of getting younger, and they're going to give Cam Akers another shot. I, I I don't think that's a terrible play there. Um, it, it could be a good one, I think, in a spot where the Chiefs are kind of rolling right now and are kind of looking to just yep. get another win and kind of keep staying dominant. And a big part of the NFL right now is trying to get the one seed. Obviously, uh, it's the only seed with the bye right now. So you need to get that one seed. And they're going to be – I think they're going to roll this team. Uh, my next best bet, it's going to be the Bears-Jets under 39 and a half. Zach Wilson's already been ruled out after his <laughs> ridiculous comments. Uh, we have uh, Justin Fields, who is hurt. I doubt – he's got a bunch of torn ligaments in his shoulder. So I doubt he goes. And if those two aren't playing, there is going to be zero points scored in this game. I think the final score might be three nothing, and I would I don't know who would win it, but Bears Jets under thirty nine and a half. I think that's a free bet. I do, I think that's a mortal lock, pick of the millennium. No one's winning that game. It <laughs> I, I, you might not be too far out off there. You know, we, we looked last week. If you want to say it's three nothing, I mean three three last or not three yeah. three ten three last week, but the only touchdown being scored on a punt return in that game. A walk off. You're not, punt, you're not, you're might, you might not be too far off on that one. Yeah, I'd take that one. And my next one is the Ravens minus four. Again, this line doesn't make sense. The Jaguars aren't good, uh, and the Ravens. I, I'm not a big. I'm not a big advocate of the Ravens. I don't think their offense is great. They don't really have any receivers. Uh, they have Mark Andrews, but other than that, it's it's pretty bad. Uh, Demarcus Robinson's their number one. The Jaguars stink. I'm not a Trevor Lawrence guy. Uh, it is on the road, so I guess that's what's factoring in here. But Ravens minus four. They're trying to trying to get ahead of us in the division. Obviously, they already are, but trying to win that division early, get it out of the way, so they don't have to play um, hard at the end. I'm gonna take Ravens minus four. Love it. Alrighty, so. There you go. If you want a special edition, kind of, as the best bet gone, we have our guest here, Elliot Rearing, giving you three bets. I'll run them down for you again. You had Chiefs minus 14 and a half, the under in the Jets-Bears game. I believe you said it was at 39. 39 yeah, 39 and a, half. and a half. 39 and a half there. And then your final one, Ravens minus four. Elliot, thank you for so, so much for coming on today and talking a little bit more, giving us a little bit more in-depth insight about this Bengals side of the ball in a very pivotal matchup against two AFC contenders. Anything you want to shout out or where we can find you on the internet? Yeah, at Twitter, I'm at E-Train513, at E-T-R-A-I-N-513. Uh, that's pretty much it. But JT, thanks for having me on. Uh, it's been an honor. Um, I know you you go out of your way to root against Cincinnati sports, but uh, I appreciate <laughs> you having the Cincinnati sports guy on here. That's, that, that makes, that makes Yeah, no problem, fun. man. It's going to be a great game. Absolutely. All right, JT, it is time for my favorite segment of the week. It is the best bet gauntlet. Let us, uh, if you have the numbers in front of you, please let our listeners know about what our current record is before we get into our favorite five picks of the week. By the way, if you're new here, the best bet gauntlet each and every week, producer JT and I pick our five favorite teams. We don't just pick them. We uh, draft them going back and forth. Nobody can double up picking our five favorite sides on the Sunday slate. And we uh, keep a record of our five best, best, our five best bets. Can't speak English this evening. And we uh, track them throughout the season, kind of a competition style. But we're trying to make money on the show, so we're rooting for each other a little bit at the same time. JT, what is our record through eleven weeks? Yeah, so through these eleven weeks here, Easton is currently a little bit comfortable in first place right now at thirty twenty two and three. And of course, me at a perfect 500 of 25, 25, and 5. But as you said, this mon past Monday show, I did this is that. where you want to be right now. Yeah. Whether joking or not, being at 500, getting ready for this stretch here, I, anything could really still happen here. So we're going to keep trying to make you money on this show. That's right. We'll keep making you money. And because I had such a great week last week, you had a good week as well. We had the best week as a show collectively we last week as ever. So if there was a time to bet all of the all of our bets down the board as a show, this might be the time. We're kind of as a heater, kind of on a heater on the Hot Read podcast. Pun intended. JT, it is your pick. You are up first. What is your first pick of the week 12 best bet gauntlet? 
Yeah, and so before the show, we were talking about just with the three games on Thanksgiving, a couple games that where there is quarterback changes. It is an ugly, ugly week, and not Disgusting. just because of the lines. It's just like who knows what any of these teams are right now, which is kind of weird for this well, JT, part of the season. The Titans Bengals game, which we're keying in on on this show, of course, it's the only game this week, excluding the Thanksgiving slate. The only game this week between two teams with a winning record. Every other game, yeah, is a team with a winning crazy. record against the team with a losing record or two losing records so it is a lot of me- two of the biggest lines we've seen all year long that we yeah. avoided like the plague and then a bunch of kind of crappy teams facing each other disgusting to have to bet but here we are yeah so for my first pick on this very yucky board here i'm gonna go with seattle minus three and a half at home I like this one. versus the raiders and there's really nothing to this one. I just look at this board and I'm seeing a Seattle team who's looking to kind of win the NFC West and kind of shock a lot of people. They're coming off the bye and they're playing at home versus a Raiders team who, despite beating the Denver Broncos last week, is still pretty reeling this season. Kind of do not have an identity quarterback play and how much they have confidence in Derek Carr is kind of a question. So give me Seattle at home off the bye. I like that bet a lot, especially betting against a team that just had the most emotional win of their season, kind of a bounce back week uh, in the wrong direction for them. I like this bet a lot. I'm also going to go with my first pick of the week 12 best bet gauntlet with a team that's coming off of the bye. Give me Tampa Bay minus three. Uh, They are at the Cleveland Browns this week. Tampa Tom and the boys were on bye this week. They, right before bye, managed a big win in I was about to say London, in Germany, against the guys you just picked, the Seattle Seahawks, and they looked for the first time all year really like a team that can be bet on. I think that they are maybe now a bet on team, and in true Tom Brady form, he's got his guys rounding into form at the right time of year. I'm going to continue to not bet against Tom Brady in December until he proves me uh, wrong for doing so. I don't love the hook here, and maybe the public will do me right and for some reason come in on the Browns to get that number back down to a flat three. I doubt that they will. I think this number will only go up, so I like getting it now. Give me Tampa Tom to cover the field goal and the hook. I like the Buccaneers to win by, frankly, a touchdown or more in this game. I'll take Tampa Bay minus three and a half. With my second pick here, I'm kind of playing a little bit of strategy this week. Okay. And even though this one is... It, it, it's it's really just one that I want to stay away with, but with this show and how we kind of do some of the rules around here, I kind of like it. I'm going to go with Bears plus six here. Now, we have two kind of questionable quarterbacks here. We have Mike White getting his first start of the season, and how we still have you. a question mark here with the Chicago quarterback. We don't know. You mean the one play. week? You mean the one week uh, MVP candidate Mike White from the 2021 season? How yes, questionable I guess, quarterback? I guess I could call. Get off of my show. Sorry. Sorry, my bad. I digress. We don't know who's going to play quarterback for the Bears here. And even if it is Trevor Simeon, I'm kind of looking to see if this line moves at all here. Um, as we, as you know on this show, uh, we, t- we pick these on Thursday night on the Friday show. And then if we get some line movement, we'll take the best line right up until the Sunday game. So I'm kind of looking to see here maybe if Justin Fields plays for the Bears. I'm going to keep this line at six here, even if it starts to go down. And if Trevor Simeon is officially named the quarterback, back and it goes up I'm just getting more points there and especially with a low over under of 38 and a half right now as long as they don't get killed I feel very good about this pick that's the that's the point right there that I think is key to all of you betters out there whether you're pros and you already know this or you're beginners great rule of thumb if you have a total in a game that is 40 points or less an NFL game that is and the spread is five points or more your success rate betting on the underdog in that game, regardless of who they are, is extremely high. Because think about it, if there's going to be very few points scored in the game, it's very difficult for the favored team to cover a dramatic spread of five, six, seven points. Typically, those games with few points are decided by three, two, one, maybe four points. Like, the odds of get you can't get blown out and also not score many points. It's not a thing. So I love that bet for you. JT, I need to preface this. Okay, <laughs> Everybody, I hope you're sitting down. Buckle in. I use, uh, and if you don't, I would highly recommend it. I use the Action Network app for a lot of my betting data. There's no better place in my knowledge on the internet to go and get in-depth data on all things betting, 
all of the information that I need to be an informed semi-pro uh, better, not really semi-pro, very serious casual better, I get from the Action Network app. And one of the things that they provide you as an Action Network subscriber like I am is access to what they call their sharp action. Now, the Action Network is clued in to all of the 20-some-odd major betting syndicates in the U.S. These are groups of professional bettors who are the ones that Vegas is scared of, really the only bettors in the world that Vegas is scared of because these guys have data just as good as the bookies in Vegas setting the lines. They find the value where Vegas is trying to dupe the public, and they clean Vegas out. And so those are the guys that are the sharps, sharps and squares you've heard of in betting. These sharps are the ones that really move lines dramatically during the week. They're the ones that Vegas has to set their lines in accordance to. And that's a great indicator of where the smart money is, where the winning money is. I check that information a lot on a lot of games. And up until now, the most that I had ever seen, you know, you, you get some games where the, the, the syndicates, the, the smart bettors are kind of split. Maybe it's two to two. Uh, you got two groups on one side and two on the other. Oftentimes, all the sharp groups are in accordance with one another. And it's, you know, four or five sharp groups on one side of the bet and none on the other. The most that I'd ever seen was maybe six or seven or eight to zero in terms of the, the sharps favoring one side. In this game, right before the show, I was looking at it and was shocked and had to tell JT. The, the sharp action so far, and this is only Thursday night, it could go up. It is 13 to nothing on this side. That is the only reason why I am going against my own word, what, like two, no more than three weeks after I promised this. And of course, here I am. I can't resist. I'm the moth to a flame. I can't resist touching it and risking getting burned. JT, I'm going to take Jacksonville plus three and a half. And I know wow. I swore that I'd wow. never bet them again on this show. And if I lose here, um, you have every right to, I could go four and one. And if my loss is Jacksonville, I'll consider this week a loss. It's going to be very frustrating, but I'm confident in, frankly, not myself, but in people much smarter and better than me at this. They love Jacksonville in this game, getting three in the hook against Baltimore, who looked very bad last week against the lowly Carolina Panthers. This Jacksonville team is absolutely better than the Panthers are. I think that Baltimore is kind of not a fraudulent team, but they're getting more love from the media, certainly, than I think they deserve. I think that this Jacksonville team is a very good young team that, frankly, just does, has not learned yet how to win. And that's a big thing. You got to have a winning culture to know how to win in the NFL. And that's something that Doug Peterson is still having to do quite a bit of down in Jacksonville. So I think that this Jacksonville team manages to lose by, a, frankly, lose by a field goal or, or maybe finally put it all together. But I don't think they get blown out. They've not really gotten blown out much at all this year. I think they keep it close. I like Jacksonville plus three and a half. Please be right. That's an interesting point there with how many sharps are on that one considering. And if you're looking to bet that one, I wouldn't mind betting that either. As you heard in our interview earlier, the uh, special guest here, Elliot Rearing, who says he's not very good at betting. One of his wacky picks was Baltimore minus four. He's so wrong. He's he wrong. might be wrong. And gotta be. You might, you might want to follow that trend there. But either way, you could win or you could go down in flames with that one, Easton. With my third pick here, I'm going to ride a hot hand in the league right now. Someone who's also playing at home and is favored by a, a pretty big margin this week. We, there are so many big margins this week, whether it's on Thanksgiving or on Sunday here. I'm going to go with the 49ers minus nine and a half, simply because I think they are just the hottest team in the league right now, playing a, a, a team that's lacking in identity right now in the New Orleans Saints. I think they're also one of the most banged up teams in the league right now. And really, I think they have the best defense. I think they have an electrifying offense. And I don't think Andy Dalton can do enough for this team to kind of keep them in this game. So I expect the 49ers to kind of run away with this one like they did last week against the Cardinals. So I'm going to take them minus nine and a half. I like that bet. And you mentioned riding the hot hand. So with my third pick of the week 12 best bet gauntlet, I'm going to Go against or go with the guy that I went against last week and lost with. It was my sole loss last week um, betting against this guy. And I, he's the hot hand in the league right now, in my opinion. I'm going to bet on him until he proves that he uh, can't can't keep winning. And that's Taylor Heineke. 
I'm going with Washington minus four hosting the Falcons who like uh, kind of very similar to the game. I think the Falcons are kind of lacking identity. There's not going to be any Kyle Pitts in this game, which, you know, that's a big weapon, not there for them. I think Heineke in this Washington team may just be a team that gets hot at the right time and sneaks into the NFC playoffs. I think that here's a take for you. I think the Giants finish fourth in their division. The NFC East is so loaded right now. I think that they uh, continue to trend up and the Giants continue to trend down. They lost today on Thanksgiving. I think that they continue to lose. I think they've always been a little fraudulent and Brian Dable did an incredible job coaching them this year. But I think the magic has run out for those New Jersey teams, both the Jets and the Giants. I like Washington to win by a touchdown here. Give me Washington minus four hosting the Atlanta Falcons. With my fourth pick here in our first of two head-to-heads this week, of course, me and Easton always have to go head-to-head every week at least one of them but we don't plan it it just happens it just kind of happens um but i'm gonna go with the eagles minus six and a half um mainly because i think with aaron Rodgers kind of coming out now and saying yes my thumb is broken i have some problems with my hand right now and i just don't trust that offense i think the eagles there have been questions about them this week um and in, in the past couple weeks of how legit they are i think they come out and kind of get a statement win winning by a touchdown here at home once again i think a lot of these this week i'm taking them because of that home field advantage here so i like them to kind of make a name for themselves and put themselves atop the nfc once again with a statement win yeah obviously i can't ride with you on this one because i'm gonna go with the packers plus six and a half for three less than obvious reasons the first of which is i'm betting on this line to move in my favor by sunday i think that green bay right now at plus six and a half i think philadelphia will be the the public team and then come sunday i can get a green bay plus seven maybe even seven and a half and get the full touchdown i love that value for me wise of you by the way to go ahead and get philadelphia under the touchdown here so this may even be a head-to-head bet that we both win listen if philadelphia wins by a touchdown and you've got minus six and a half and i've got plus seven and a half we could both walk away happy here the other two reasons i'm betting on this packers team is the packers desperation and primarily this is less of a bet on the packers and more of a bet against the eagles i've teased for a couple of episodes now that I've I had a take early in the year on the Eagles um, and it's kind of starting to come to fruition they've looked like less than the best team in the league to say the least in the past two games for them so I think that the maybe continue to trend down and with the Packers desperate in this game which they obviously are they have to kind of win out to have a chance to get in the playoffs I think that they pull off another surprising win as they did two games ago two weeks ago against this Cowboys team that looks very good right now Uh, these NFC teams that are good I think are are kind of just bad like mediocre teams having good weeks um i'll believe that there's a really great nfc team when somebody puts together a couple consistent weeks here in december when the games really matter until then i think that this packers team could be just desperate enough to maybe lose by a field goal frankly with our fifth and final pick if you've been watching the show you i'll, know I'll give our listeners coming. three picks all right three guesses as to what three this pick is what... and two of them don't count <laughs> It, it, it's pretty obvious. I'm going to go here with the line today. I wish I could have gotten this at a line earlier this week, but I'm going to take the Cincinnati Bengals here, minus two and a half, mainly because I think this is going to be a lot of what the divisional game was last week, and I think it's going to come down to a field goal wins it here, and I'm going to go with the Cincinnati Bengals here. Um, I think there's a couple reasons, like you heard in our interview, that the, the Cincinnati Bengals know how to keep just keep scoring and despite the Tennessee Titans continuing to get better and better in that second half I just don't think they'll be able to keep up with them which is why even if it is a close game and the, the Bengals are not scoring as much I expect them to just do enough to get the win here yeah so I love I love the Titans here I'm gonna go Titans plus two and a half I'm almost certainly gonna get Titans plus three I think that the Bengals are gonna be the very public team this week and that I'll get a much better number come Sunday so if you're gonna bet along with us maybe put a little on Titans plus two and a half right now that's what I did and then wait to see if you can get that three or maybe even the hook we'll have to see maybe the public loves Cincinnati this week I'm just betting with the numbers here frankly Mike Vrabel off extended rest nine and oh the Titans against the spread this year, eight or uh, eight and two. They are 
constantly and continually undervalued by Vegas and by the public. I'm going to continue to take the free money where I can get it. And uh, I think the Titans win this game outright. So um, that's what we'll have to. It'll be a, a great Monday episode, regardless of the outcome. It'll be a fantastic one because somebody will be uh, not so happy and somebody will be rather happy. So it's going to be fantastic. And I think that's going to do it. So in recap, JT. This week, riding with four favorites, he's going with Philadelphia, minus six and a half, Seattle, minus three and a half, Chicago, plus six, San Francisco, minus nine and a half, and Cincinnati, minus two and a half. I am riding with two favorites and three dogs. Give me Tampa Bay, minus three and a half, Jacksonville, plus three and a half, Washington, minus four, Green Bay, plus six and a half, and Tennessee, plus two and a half. Those are our best bets for week 11. JT, best of luck to you. Hope we can both. Find a way to get out of this week with yet another winning week and make some money for our listeners. Hope you guys bet with us. If you do, when we post the best bet gauntlet graphic on social media this weekend, let us know in the comments. Tweet at us. Let us know if you're riding with us, fading us, what your favorite bets are. We love to hear from you guys and interact. So please do that. And that's going to do it for today. Because it's a holiday, I'm going to save you all the selling. Here's the brief rundown. If you're a business and want to advertise with us, please reach out to us via social media or on the site via email. We'd love to advertise on the show or on the site with you. If you're not subscribed to the show already, please go subscribe. Please leave us a five-star rating and review. Actually do it. Don't just listen to me say it and don't do it like you do on every other show. It means a ton to us. And if you leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, we will shout you out on the show and follow you on Twitter if you leave your handle. And then finally, if you are not a Broadway insider, please go become one today. You get all of our fantastic content behind the paywall, which is the, the Mike Herndon show in its entirety on uh, in video format on YouTube. You get the premium articles, the early access articles, including more that I'm not going to name right now because I'm trying to go fast. All right, until Monday, which we'll be back first thing Monday morning to review the Titans hosting the Bengals in a very much revenge spot. I am Easton Freeze for producer JT. This has been the Hot Read Podcast. We'll talk to you Monday. Monday.